We are presenting to the world our new national security strategy. Whether we like it or not, we are engaged in a new era of competition. We also face rival powers, Russia and China, that seek to challenge American influence, values, and wealth. The U.S. and NATO have been ramping up tensions with China in the past year. NATO, which originally began as an alliance of nations bordering the Northern Atlantic Ocean, hence the Northern Atlantic Treaty Organization, is now expanding and seeking to gain as many members as possible, including venturing out into the Pacific with the aim of recruiting Australia and New Zealand. It is also reflected in the fact that we are now significantly strengthening our partnership with our Indo-Pacific partners. Uh, with Australia, with, uh, with New Zealand, Japan, and South Korea. They participated in the meeting uh, uh, today. If not recruiting them directly into NATO, at least creating military and political partnerships that oppose everything about China. Yet the relationship with Australia and New Zealand to the US and NATO powers is already pretty strong and has been for some time now. It is deeply concerning to see nations like these step up their rhetoric against China as if the Asian country is somehow existentially threatening the Pacific countries. Well, if you listen to only the U.S. mainstream news, then yeah, it'll sound like some existential threat is coming from China. In reality, there is no existential threat posed by China towards Australia or New Zealand. But why are tiny countries like New Zealand and even larger ones like Australia beating the war drums and backing up everything the U.S. says without any critical or moral thought? Why do yeah. you think that war could break out within three years? Well, it's certainly a potential. Uh, we prefer peace, not war, and that's what all democracies want. But the statements of Pre um, President Xi and his new foreign minister this week are really indicative of a quite aggressive China that is willing to undertake a no-holds-barred military expansion to get what it wants in the Western Pacific, including taking back Taiwan. They've been very clear about that over the last two decades. There was a bit of pushback in Australia this week that you were being a bit overly alarmist. Are you being overly alarmist with that time frame? No, it's, there's nothing alarmist about that time frame. Defence over the last couple of years has said we no longer have the 10-year warning time we used to plan on. Senior American commanders, both in the Indo-Pacific and the Pentagon, have warned that the next three to four years are the most dangerous period for us to traverse. So there's nothing alarmist about that timeline. This is really about informing the Australian public about the kind of risks that our country faces. Let's understand this situation with a little history to provide some context to this alarming and potentially disastrous situation. Welcome to the Global Network. Please support us by clicking the like button and subscribing to our social media accounts to stay up to date with our content. If you want to go further, consider joining our organization by visiting our website, spaceforpeace.org. To understand how and why countries like Australia and New Zealand have been following in the footsteps of the United States for several decades now, we need to understand three key agreements, Five Eyes, ANZUS, and AUKUS. Before describing these agreements though, we should understand that all of these countries do share similar backgrounds. Each of these countries do share similar cultures, which all stem from Europe and who speak English. All of them are liberal democracies, which is just a fancy way of saying capitalist countries. And they all share the history of European settlers destroying indigenous lands and lives, and therefore share similar interests in racism, capitalism, and even imperialism. Five Eyes is the oldest agreement with these countries in hand, dating back to the 1941 Atlantic Charter, which established a post-World War structure and vision. Five Eyes is an intelligence alliance between Australia, Canada, New Zealand, United Kingdom, and the United States. Originally starting as an alliance which warned of open conflict with the Soviet bloc and sought to unite English-speaking countries. As the Cold War deepened, the intelligence sharing arrangement became more formalized under Echelon, a surveillance program to the 1960s. Originally set up to monitor communication signals from the Soviet Union during the Cold War, it easily transformed into a program to monitor the world's communications. 
And by the 21st century, Five Eyes had already started to set up monitorization of the World Wide Web to track everything from everyone, but justified by the war on terror. Later, Edward Snowden leaked information to the world about this illegal intelligence gathering programs of the NSA and Five Eyes. He described Five Eyes as a supranational intelligence organization that does not answer to the known laws of its own countries. To think that the U.S., along with Australia, New Zealand, and the rest, do not use these global spying programs against countries like China is laughable. And to learn more about the Five Eyes program, the Global Network has already produced a video on its history titled, How Military Satellites Spy on You. In 1951, the ANZUS Agreement more concretely solidified the relationships between Australia, New Zealand, and the United States. ANZUS is a non-binding collective security agreement with the goal of cooperating on military issues in the Pacific region, but has grown to relate to conflicts around the world. Basically, this agreement tries to say that an attack on any of these countries is an attack on all countries and that each should act to meet the common threat. If the United States were attacked, then Australia and New Zealand would contribute to supporting the U.S. Vice versa, if New Zealand were attacked, the other two countries would be there to provide support. History has shown that when the United States was attacked, say for example in 9-11, Australia and New Zealand were some of the first countries to send troops and equipment to the Afghanistan invasion and later to Iraq. In fact, the only time in history where the ANZUS agreement was invoked was in response to 9-11. The question remains, if Australia and New Zealand were attacked, would the United States come to their aid? Fortunately, or maybe unfortunately, we do not have any examples of the situation to know exactly what the U.S. would do. We do know that much of the agreements between the Pacific countries and the U.S. favor mostly the U.S. Dr. Emma Shortis wrote a book on this relationship between Australia and the U.S. titled Our Exceptional Friend. Listen to what she has to say about this relationship. The ANZUS Treaty. It's kind of like the the beating heart of, of Australia's relationship with the United States. And I guess Australia's foreign policy is kind of built around it and built around this particular relationship with the United States, which really, I argue in the book, I suppose, predetermines Australian foreign policy to see the world in terms of military threat in particular and the protection that we imagine that we get from the United States through this special relationship. Yeah, so I guess one of the main qualities of this agreement and certainly the first thing I remember learning about it probably when I was a kid was that it's kind of thought to guarantee military support for Australia in the event of a conflict. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Like that's one of the central assumptions again about the alliance and that that revolves around Article 4 of, of the ANZUS Treaty which commits the the signatories which at the, you know at the time of signing were Australia, New Zealand and the United States to act in the face of a common danger. It's a kind of this one word act and what I argue in the book is that, you know, the word act could really mean absolutely anything. You know, it could mean that the United States is sending like a strongly worded letter to the United Nations or something. So this idea that we have this protection, this protection guarantee, I think is kind of just wrong. You know, the United States might come to our rescue, but they would only ever do that if they saw it as in their own interests. Dr. Shortest makes a lot of really good points, but what if the situation with China is somewhat different than previous conflict? Can the tensions building up in East Asia between China and Taiwan, along with bordering countries in the region like the Korean Peninsula, Japan, the Philippines, could this conflict be on a higher, more devastating level? And if so, wouldn't this require Australia to actually really be involved? What I would say is that often the relationship that we have with the United States leads us to really misunderstand the strategic implications and the level of threat that those kind of actions pose. You know, so so often we talk about, I, I'm, I'm kind of using air quotes here, Chinese influence in Australia as if 
Australia is kind of removed from anything else that is happening in the world and particularly from being implicated in what the United States has done in the world. You know, the Chinese regime is so conscious of the fact, for example, that we have two and a half thousand American Marines rotating through northern Australia. You know, that sends a very clear message. And so often we act as if Chinese actions kind of are coming from a void and aren't related to what Australia has done. And I think, again, that's a real distortion of the debate. Again, not to excuse anything that's happening on either side. The AUKUS agreement is a trilateral security pact between Australia, the United Kingdom, and the United States. And it was announced on the 15th of September in 2021 in the Indo-Pacific region or Asia-Pacific region. Under the pact, the US and the UK will assist Australia in acquiring nuclear-powered submarines. The pact also includes cooperation on advanced cyber mechanisms, artificial intelligence and autonomy, quantum technologies, undersea capabilities, hypersonic and counter-hypersonic electronic warfare, innovation, and information sharing. The AUKUS agreement we confirm here in San Diego represents the biggest single investment in Australia's defence capability in all of our history. Despite the concerns brought up by Dr. Shortis, Australia's political and military leadership is showing the world where it stands, behind the US against China. New Zealand's Minister of Foreign Affairs, Nanaya Mahuda, made sure that her first visit overseas was to the United States, where she met up with Anthony Blinken, a sure sign that New Zealand is choosing a clear side in this new Cold War with China. Look at how she speaks to the US compared to how she speaks to China. Uh, It gives me great pleasure to be here today and thank Secretary Blinken for his warm hospitality. As was mentioned, this is my first trip as Foreign Minister overseas and and it was important uh, to come here uh, to the United States to reaffirm the warm bilateral relationships that we have and the interest that the US has shown in the Pacific and wider Indo-Pacific region. Previously, we've, New Zealand's been quite consistent in raising the issue uh, with regards to the Uyghur people in Xinjiang uh, and also uh, a number of other issues in relation to uh, Tibet and Hong Kong, uh, Taiwan and the South China Sea. Mahuda is quick to bring up concerns within China in regards to Xinjiang, Tibet, Hong Kong and Taiwan. But when it comes to the U.S., not a word about the police killing innocent black people. I mean, the George Floyd uprising in 2020 was the largest protest in U.S. history. Not a peep about it. How about the recent expansion of U.S. military bases in the Philippines under Bong Bong Marcos, the son of a dictator who is continuing fascist rule in the country? No concern there? Clearly, New Zealand political leaders are pushing to choose one side, but doing it very diplomatically. This is the continuation of the alliance between the two countries. Last year during RIMPAC, the world's largest international maritime warfare exercise, both New Zealand and Australia sent their largest warships. Its defense minister, Andrew Little, said this, So uh, uh, an independent foreign policy is about us having the agency and the ability to make decisions in our best interests, and that's what we do. Does it get confusing for people? I mean, you know, we we want to support Pacific Whanau, we want to have intelligence cooperation through Five Eyes, but we we won't pick sides when it comes because we've got trade with China and we've got military up in China. It's quite a confusing policy for people. I, I don't think it is. I think it's it's values based, and the reason the reason we're supporting Ukraine is because and we're far far away from Ukraine, but it is in our interest because what Russia has mm. done is invaded Ukraine, um, illegal yep. and uh, an unprincipled conflict. As as a small nation state, we depend on the international rule of law to be upheld, and when we see it breached in an egregious way, it's in our interests on a values basis um, to participate in the worldwide effort to push Russia back in that respect. Likewise, if we see a country like China uh, acting in a way that is in breach of international rule of law, we will have a dialogue with China about it. We stand on our values uh, and in our best interests. In the end, English-speaking countries are capitalist countries. 
these capitalists would rather keep the remaining global order of an English-speaking dominant leadership in the current imperialist system, and they don't want any challengers like Russia or China. Choosing the West or the East aren't the only options available, though. But these politicians sure make it sound like that. Australia, New Zealand, the US, the UK, and even Canada, the original Five Eyes countries, as long as they remain capitalist, they will continue to ally with each other against any other challenger, even if it means world war and the devastation of billions of innocent people.